So given that Fourier series seems so useful and yet so uh, incompatible with the current understanding of calculus in the early 19th century, what, what happened with that? Well, it was a crisis. Um, not every mathematician was, or you know, scientist was uh, invested in the crisis, but it was serious enough that the, a lot of the best minds really, really felt it needed to be addressed. Uh, one of the big first steps was in 1826, uh, Dirichlet, who was a student of Fourier, um, he pr you know, provided the first rigorous proof that Fourier's infinite sums really made sense. So remember that the infinite sums that Fourier was, was providing, it wasn't clear if they even made sense in a lot of cases. And he provided some conditions that uh, guaranteed you that, it, that these infinite sums would make sense. In the 1820s as well, uh, Cauchy, very influential French mathematician, he started to put calculus on a firm and rigorous footing for the fir very first time, really. Um, and a lot of this was motivated by the crisis caused by Fourier series. And so he was, he was working very much in the same vein as Dirichlet, but in a more general way to, to really address the foundations of calculus. He introduced the key notion of a limit. This is something that we start out our students with. Um, as the basis of calculus, but it was not the basis of calculus for the first you know, 150 or so years of the subject. Um, he was hated by his students, apparently. His students did not appreciate this incredibly careful, rigorous treatment that they didn't necessarily feel was necessary. This, the echoes of that are still true when, in students who take calculus classes today. He was barely tolerated by his colleagues and superiors at his institution. Um, it was a, uh, a military engineering institution, and they didn't see, I think they didn't see any good reason for him to be so careful about this, but it was absolutely a fundamental shift in mathematics, and um, it wouldn't have been possible to really be sure of the, the, wh how Fourier, the Fourier story was working without what he did. And I think in, at the very end of this series, I'll talk a little bit more about limits, but let me, let me give you some pictures about uh, Cauchy's fundamental idea. So we can phrase it, he wouldn't have phrased it this way, but we can think of it as kind of a game, and it's, it's got two Greek letters associated to it, epsilon and delta, which are always the, the, the letters that are associated to this in, in uh, mathematics. What we've got is we've got a function, um, so an input and output. I, always, I, I often give the example in my calculus classes that maybe this input is a dial setting for some um, chemical chamber or something, and then this is the temperature in the chamber. And we want to control the temperature via the dial setting. And here's the curve that gives us the prediction of, for a certain dial setting, like dial setting A, we'll get temperature L. And the essential point is that we're uh, unlikely to be able to nail the dial setting exactly A. We're going to always have some error, either in the setting or in the process or in, in something of this situation. So we have to allow for some output error tolerance and epsilon is usually the name for the error tolerance. So we say, well, we'd like to get the temperature to be exactly L, but we're okay if it's in this green band between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. And we're thinking of epsilon usually as pretty small, or else we're not uh, requiring very much. And then is it, what's going to make this an okay situation is, can we guarantee that we will actually get the height of this curve within the green band, given that we uh, require the dial setting to be in some sort of fence. And the fence, the width of the fence, is measured by delta. So if somebody can guarantee, say suppose I want the temperature to be correct within one degree, if somebody can come along and say, okay, if, as long as you set the dial setting within one millimeter, I can guarantee, I've analyzed this function, and I can guarantee that as long as your input is controlled pretty well, your output will be controlled pretty well. Now, for a lot of engineering purposes, that's sort of where you'd stop. You have a particular value of epsilon in mind, maybe one degree or a tenth of a degree or 10 degrees, depending on how precise you want to be. And then if somebody can give you the particular one value of delta that tells you how precise you, your dial setting has to be, then you're fine. But the mathematician is supposed to serve all possible masters, all possible engineers, all possible situations. And the key thing about the Cauchy version of this is that we say this function is nice where we say that the limit of the values of this function as x approaches a is equal to l if this works no matter what error tolerance you, can, you give me. 
I can be very loose and lax and say, oh, I just need it within 10 degrees, and then you need to be able to give me a, specific, a delta that, that, that makes sure that we can do that. So then somebody else comes along and says, no, 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 I need to be more precise. I need to be one, within one degree. I need to be able to give a, a delta, almost certainly smaller delta, to accommodate that. Somebody else comes along and says, no, I need this epsilon to be one, one millionth of a degree. You're going to need to have a smaller delta. If you can always provide a delta for any epsilon, play and play this game, basically, that someone gives you an epsilon and you can always respond with a delta that works, then we say that the limit of this function, the value of this function as x approaches a, is equal to L. Let me show you an example where it doesn't work. So here's a contrast. Here is an example where, very much like the previous picture, where the limit as x approaches a would be this value f of a. Um, and another way to say it, related uh, thing to say, is that this function is continuous. This doesn't have a, a break or some nasty behavior here. I can, as long as I, I put the values of x close to a, I can guarantee that the values of the, of the function, the height of the function, is within some nice uh, boundary. They just say close to f of a here. They don't use epsilon and delta, but it's the idea. Here's an example where it fails. So we have a sharp break in the function. This is definitely qualitatively worse than this, but how can we make that really precise? What's going on here is that um, no matter how close I get, how small a fence I require the values of the input of this function to be, the output varies drastically. And suppose this was my standard, this orange bar was my standard of how close to f of a I need to be guaranteed to be. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, maybe if I exactly get a as the input, I'll exactly get f of a as the output. Great, but if I just go a tiny bit to the right or a tiny bit to the left, no matter how restrictive I am on the values of the input, the values of the output are going to jump. This fails that epsilon delta game. Then an epsilon that basically corresponds to this orange orange band is going to produce no acceptable response in terms of a delta, no wiggle room at all in the input to make sure that the output is within this band. And so this is a situation where it's not continuous and the limit does not exist. So this topic um, presented in the level of detail I just I, it gave you, and when you really kind of make it um, precise and you actually do problems on it, it's still just outside what most students learn. Even if you're learning calculus, it's the stuff that got taken off of the BC calculus syllabus a few years ago. Um, and even when people were teaching it, it nobody really understood it, um, or very few people understood it. Um, it's basically really understanding this carefully and being able to use it is pretty much what makes you a math major. Um, it's, 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 it's right at that cusp. So what that means is that most people who are learning and using mathematics are really learning mathematics from about the year 1800 um, in terms of this idea of rigor and do we really understand the rigorous foundation of calculus. So that does mean that most engineers and scientists don't absolutely have to understand um, these transformative things that happened in the 19th century. Now, the mathematics that they learn that's more advanced, like Fourier series, uh, quantum mechanics, differential equations, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have been developed, and it certainly wouldn't be true if you didn't have this. But it's still in the background for most people. So um, that was that was Dirichlet and Cauchy early, about through the 1820s. Um, Cauchy still got some things wrong. There's some very famous theorems that uh, we mention and sort of pretend to teach to high school calculus students or freshman college calculus students, um, such as the mean value theorem, that Cauchy got very close to being correct about, but we're still not quite right. In the mid-1800s, two huge figures, Riemann, who is very famous for many other things, um, but in particular he investigated the foundations of calculus, again very much based on trying to understand Fourier ideas, and Weierstrass, both German mathematicians in the mid-1800s, they brought the subject quite close to modern rigor. Um, if you look at the name we give to calculus students for the, ver the rigorous version of integration, finding the area under curve, we call it a Riemann sum because that brought it pretty close to something that's both usable, relatively simple, and rigorous. Um, but there were still some mysteries going around. There were still definitely unexplained phenomena and it, pretty obvious questions that everybody wanted to know the answers to if you had any interest in what was really going on with calculus and especially with Fourier series. Okay? Here's the next uh, part of the story. It's really cool. And part of why I gave this talk is it, it's, it links up with talks I gave uh, a little while ago about uh, Georg Cantor and infinities. Okay? 
Um, it turns out people eventually realized that calculus wasn't the fundamental problem. People, we definitely needed to reinvent calculus and make it rigorous, but there was stuff even more fundamental than calculus that wasn't understood, and that was definitely not uh, on anybody's radar until um, well after 1850, I would say. The Fourier story, the, the power and flexibility of the Fourier idea of making functions out of wiggles, it's a weird enough idea uh, to make us redo the very ideas of numbers and sets. So let me talk about that. So this is where Georg Cantor comes into the picture. Um, in the 1870s, Cantor was 24 years old, and he's given a, a problem, a suggestion to work on to sort of complete his training uh, as a mathematician. Um, and that's the problem of uniqueness of trigonometric series. And I, I do really want to not talk about the details here. And I apologize for people who want a more technical presentation, but that's, this is not it. Um, basically, how well we've got these recipes that make functions of making them out of cer certain amounts of certain kinds of wiggles, of certain frequencies. How well do the recipes reflect the function that they make? Could we have um, the same function, exactly the same result? Could we make it with two different recipes? That would be interesting and not ideal. We'd like functions and recipes to just correspond um, perfectly. In particular, a special case of that, and in fact, this is the only special case you really have to understand um, to understand the problem, is could a recipe this not just take zero of all possible wiggles. Could it ma magically kind of collapse to give the zero function? Could we have a bunch of wiggles that magically cancel each other out absolutely everywhere? We've seen from the pictures that I've shown you in other parts of this video that uh, the wiggles do cancel each other out in interesting ways. And we can have a bunch of wiggles that cancel out to be a function that's suspiciously not wiggly looking. And it's, it's tricky to do that, but it's possible. But it, could it actually collapse completely and give the zero function? That would be very weird and, and basically unpleasant, probably, to have something where you expect you're putting in ingredients that are trying to give something interesting, and yet it all magically collapses. Okay. Well, can't, the first thing Cantor proved, even this was quite, was quite challenging, he proved the recipe can't collapse completely. That's a fundamental result about um, series uh, sums of of waves, of trigonometric functions. And it's, um, it's going a little bit beyond the Fourier idea, because Fourier has a particular recipe for doing this that works in most cases. And if you use that recipe, or that the, the method of getting the, the, the particular numbers, the, um, of taking a function and figuring out the recipe, then it's easy to prove this. But if you go beyond that idea and say, just let's look at any way of putting these pieces together, these wiggly pieces, um, it's actually surprisingly hard to figure out that you can't have it magically collapse. But the, the real import of Cantor's work, why it became so earth-shattering, is that he went further. Um, he looked at the, the following generalization of the problem. Wouldn't it be strange? We know that Fourier series, and especially very, very general combinations of, of sines and cosines, sine waves, we know they can produce very unexpected results. But it would be very strange if you could create this function out of waves. So here's a graph of a function. I'm trying to indicate that it's 0 almost everywhere, um, except at a finite number of points. It just blips up. It's literally 0 everywhere, but at this point, this point, this point, this point, at 6 points. That's a very strange function. Now again, in by the mid-19th century, people had realized we've got to deal with these kinds of functions. It's very strange. It's not something that Euler would have called a function at all. It's not a nice curve, because it's, it's mostly this nice curve, but with some exceptional points. Um, so it would still be really weird if you could create this function that was 0 almost everywhere and just non-zero at these six points out of waves that are all nice and continuous. But we've already seen that the Fourier process, or the, the, the general process of putting waves together, um, can produce unexpected results. Is it really impossible to prove to, to create this guy? Okay. Well, he did prove that you can't create this out of, out of waves. So at least there's some of our intuition is, is intact, that there's a border beyond which you cannot cross. You can't create something absolutely bizarre that just looks so unwave like um, So he did prove that. It's surprisingly hard to prove. That in itself would, would have made him a, a, a pretty decently important figure in mathematics. But he went even further. He said, OK, um, we can't create something that's just everywhere zero unless we just use the zero recipe. Don't put anything of any, any kind of any waves in at all. We've shown that you can't create something that has just a few exceptional points and is mostly just zero. Well, but how big the set can a set can you allow as exceptions? Does it have to be just is it just finite sets that you can't get? 
Are there some kinds of infinite sets that you can't get, where the function blips up on only that infinite set? Well, it turns out, oops, let's see. It turns out that what this led him to is these very clever procedures that created kind of more and more interesting and complicated sets, infinite sequences of new sets when he starts analyzing what are these sets of exceptions that we might be able to allow in this theorem. And he created an infinite sequence of new sets and then he realized there's a way to jump out of that loop and create another infinite sequence of sets and sort of and he realized that what he was doing was going to infinity and beyond. And that led Cantor to the discovery of the different kinds of infinity. And uh, along the way, many different kinds of sets of numbers. So two huge, huge realizations here. And again, I, I have decided not to try to go into the details. And this is something that beg, begs a little bit more explanation. But this is where you could go to um, my videos about ordinal numbers, for example, or uh, to infinity and beyond, where I talk more about this. Um, the two big kinds of realizations were that infinity is an interesting concept, and it's not just a philosophical concept, it's a mathematical concept, and that there are many different kinds of infinity. That was not expected at all. And that there are many different kinds of sets of numbers. They can be very interesting and very weirdly behaved, and that they can be interesting in themselves. Nobody would have thought the idea of just putting a bunch of things in a bag, basically just a set has no structure, it's not algebra, it's not calculus, how could that possibly be interesting? Well, it's not just interesting, it's devilishly complicated and interesting. And that, um, those were big revelations that Cantor came to, and it was all based on trying to really understand uh, the ideas that Fourier started in 1807. So I'll talk in the next video more about um, what happens after Cantor, um, even more stuff that comes out of the Fourier idea, and then uh, wrap it up maybe in the next one, maybe in the one after.